Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much to give me the opportunity to present this paper. This is joint work with Yong Chao and Chen Yao, and I'm Mao Ye from University of Illinois. So thinking about stock exchange is one of the most important institutions in the United States. And all the stock exchange in the United States are for-profit institutions. But thinking about most finance models, in most finance models, we trade without stock exchange. Or even with uh, models with stock exchange, they are non-for-profit. Okay, so I have two research questions for this paper. First, how do exchange, stock exchanges compete on their service fees? And the second, how does the fee, uh, the fee competition shape the organization of the stock exchange industry? And my paper is motivated by two surprising facts. So the first motivation is market fragmentation. And according to SEC, there are proliferations of cloned stock exchanges in the United States. So in this graph, probably you know the New York Stock Exchange. But New York Stock Exchange is only one of the three exchanges offered by Intercontinental Exchange Group. And they also have a, compa a competing operator, which is called BATS Global Markets. So BATS Global Markets have four stock exchanges. And NASDAQ have three stock exchanges. OK, these exchanges are so similar, actually. They are called cloned markets. So we think, for some sense, like law of one price should hold. They have ide almost identical services. They should charge almost identical fees. But you can see the heterogeneous fees for identical transaction services. And more interestingly, it's like there's frequent ch fee changes. This is only the tips of the iceberg, because sometimes they even change the name of the fee, for example, different tiers. So this is only part of the frequent change of the fee. But you can already see like the fee change actually is not stable. OK, because the fee structure is so complex, recently there is a proposal to ban the current exchange pricing model. And uh, actually, there is a proposal to completely change the pricing model into a different regime. OK. So I want to convince you in this paper. It's a small friction, but it has a significant impact. Think about the most theory model we work. I mean, usually, there's an important but implicit assumption, which is continuous pricing. But in reality, actually, the price are actually can be quite discrete. Why? One reason is because of regulation. For example, there's some SEC 612 set one cent minimum price variation for any stock with price above one dollar. OK, so I want to convince you in this paper, tick size have two economic impacts. First, it generates second degree price discrimination. That explains why the same operator offer multiple stock exchanges. And also, a tick size actually destroys any pure strategy equilibrium. That explains why fee frequently change, and also explains, I mean, uh, di uh, uh, diversity of fee change, and also they change frequently. Okay. So first, what is tick size? Okay. So now the U.S. stock exchanges are mostly limit order books, which have this pricing grid, and the tick size is the minimum price increment. And then, how do trades occur? I mean, first of all, I want to say the conference organizers allow me to use their pictures, okay? So suppose I'm the one to buy, Jim wants to sell, and there's an empty limit order book. For trade to happen, Armour can first, uh, first propose a limit order at price of five. And because Armour, you propose a price, you are called make. Okay, for trade to happen, you need another part, which is called taker, which is J. So once a trade happens, a maker, a taker, Limit order, market order. Once they match, the exchange actually profit from the fees. So the maker needs to pay a make fee, and the taker needs to pay a, pay a take fee. And the sum of make take fee, which is called total fee, is the profit of the stock exchange. And it can be continuous. That's the main economic impact I mean, in my model. It's like there's no take size for fees. And also, fees are usually sub penny. And they can be negative. That means the rebates. Although, I mean, fees are small, but it's a significant proportion of exchange profit. For example, in BAT's application for IPOs, 70% of the profit is coming from these make-take fees. Okay, I try to model this into a, this is a theoretical paper. I try to model this fee competition into a three-period game. So in first period, we have operator or operators. I mean, operators make two decisions. So first is number of stock exchanges they establish. Second one is, suppose you establish an exchange, you need to set a new fee structure. That are two choices. And in the second period, 
nature randomly draw one liquidity maker with valuation in the uniform distribution from a half to one. And the liquidity maker can choose to submit no limit order. And once he decided to, choose, uh, to submit a limit order, he needs to choose the exchange. And also the limit order price, PI, in that stock exchange. OK. And uh, then the liquidity taker move in the third period. Nature draw a random liquidity taker from this uniform distribution. He can reject the limit order, and no trade happen. But he can also accept the order. And the exchange will be happy, because once taker and maker match, they can collect the fees. And what's the prediction of the model? I want to show you. The prediction is significantly different with continuous price and the discrete price. I will focus on the discrete price, but the prediction on the continuous tick size actually is you can apply economic intuition to understand why. First, there's a famous result, neutrality of tax and subsidy. That means, I mean, for a given level of tax, it doesn't matter which side you tax. So on the continuous tick size, only total fee matters. OK, so then the exchanges, uh, exchanges would compete on total fee. Then the same operator has no incentive to establish multiple stock exchanges. Because even if he establish more than one exchange, either they look identical, or all the uh, liquidity maker and the taker will go to the exchange with the lowest, uh, lowest total fee. OK, suppose we have more than one exchange operator. How do they compete? Actually, it's one-dimensional competition in total fee. And the, the market outcome actually is the trend. They undercut each other's total fee towards zero. And there's a zero total fee, zero profit. And this deters exchange entry. OK, what's our prediction of that? Actually, it's consolidation. With any fixed cost to establish a stock exchange, we will see one operator, one exchange, with no fee dispersion, which does not match matches the sterilized facts. But next one I want to show you, on the discrete tick size, actually. First, there's non-neutrality. Why? It's because the exchange can set continuous price, and the traders can only quote discrete price. If the exchange's price actually is sub-penny, the liquidity maker and the taker cannot neutralize the fee. OK, so this non-neutrality actually means like the price competition now is two-dimensional. Exchange compete in both make fee and take fee. That gives the incentive for second degree price discrimination. Actually, a single operator have incentive to, uh, to, op uh, to create multiple stock exchanges. And what's the market outcome of competing operators? No pure strategy equilibrium. And I will also want to show you is like any mixed strategy equilibrium in this game has positive profit. OK. So first is non-neutrality. OK. So first, let me simplify the model. I want to present a simple model. Let's have a very large tick size, which is equal to 1. OK. So liquidity maker arrive in the first period, uh, arrive first. And uh, his valuation is above the midpoint. And liquidity taker arrive next. And his valuation is smaller than the midpoint. So, but trade cannot happen. I mean, this is a simplification. Because the maker want to buy at zero. And the taker and the seller want to sell at one. So actually, there's no trade. So now, let's fix the total fee. We change the structure of the fee. We, we charge the first guy 0.5. We subsidize the second guy 0.5. What's the market outcome? So the first guy, because you charge him 0.5, he, he wants to buy. He only say, I buy at zero. But the effective buy price is 0.5, because he also needs to pay the fee. The, the seller or the taker, actually, because of the subsidy, he will accept the offer, because he got subsidy. That means effective sale price is 0.5. And trades can always happen in this game. It's a simplified model, OK. OK. So then, First result is that tick size leads to non-neutrality. Why? Because traders cannot neutralize sub-tick prices. OK. So that changed the exchange competition from one dimension, the total fee, to total dimensional, the make fee and the take fee. Under this simplification, actually, the simplification, I try to present a simpl simplified model. Because we restrict the price they can propose, actually, it's exchange uniquely decides the buy and sell price. This is a simplified model. So there's the exchanges actually compete on two things, effective buy price and effective sale price. OK, so 
Starting from now, we will focus on the competition in setting effective buy price and effective sale price. Okay. This paper also demonstrated that many results are robust where you, the tick size is smaller than one with much more mathematical complexity. Okay. So I want to first show you the second degree price discrimination. Okay. So let's solve this sub-game perfect equilibrium. It's a sequential game. So the taker arrived in the last period. What is his choice? He will accept a limit order post in the previous period if the valuation is smaller than the effective sale price. So that means the, a, a, a higher effective sale price actually increase the probability the liquidity taker will accept the offer. Okay, this is the last period. Next, we think about the liquidity maker's choice, the limit order's choice. Here I want to define a concept in my paper called the equality of the stock exchange. What does that mean? So first, look at the liquidity maker's effective surplus by choosing exchange I. The effective surplus it has two parts. The first part is gains from execution. That's conditional execution, which is VB minus PBI. Okay. But he also needs to consider the probability liquidity taker will accept his offer. It's this part, which is called executing probability. So if we fix the effective buy price, a liquidity maker actually will prefer I exchange with better terms of the trade for his counterparty because that increases the probability the liquidity taker will accept his offer. So here I define a new concept. It's like the exchange with high PS actually has high quality. Okay, so I use the quality for that, for simplification. And then two exchanges with different effective sale price actually are vertical differentiated. Okay. So how can they coexist? First, this is the surplus. I, I just drew a line here. So the x-axis is PPI, and the slope of the line actually is 2 PSI. Let's bring another exchange. This exchange has high quality, but it, it also charges a high price. And there's a unique crossing here, which is called a phi. And the red line is the uh, upper envelope of the surplus, right? And then we have this interesting equilibrium. It's like uh, conditional exogenous fees. Low valuation liquidity makers choose low quality exchange. And high valuation makers choose high quality exchange. And actually, that's the foundation for the price discrimination. So here's the benchmark. Suppose we, have, we mandate a monopoly operator can only open one exchange. And then his profit has three parts. The first part is, this is total fee, okay? Effective buy price minus effective sale price, okay? And it also needs to be multiplied by 2x participation probability. The participation probability for the maker and the participation probability for the uh, taker. And the solution actually is pretty beautiful. It's like a monopoly exchange will set the effective sale price equal to a third, effective buy price equal to two thirds, and this is the total fee. It's also one third. Then what is price discrimination? Okay. Price discrimination is like an exchange operator can open two exchanges in this graph to segment the trader so that phi here is equal to four fifths. And there's a one low quality exchange and a high quality exchange. The interesting, beautiful result is like actually they equally share the liquidity maker. Okay, these two exchanges just happen to share, each of them share one fifth of. Okay. So, then we know that price discrimination will definitely increase the profit of the exchange operator. We know that, right? Uh, but interestingly, in this model, it's like price discrimination also increases the expected surplus both for the liquidity maker and the liquidity taker. So why? So it's because in this type of price discrimination, why they, uh, although they do price discrimination, but they also create more continuous trading prices. So actually, that increases the trading participation. Okay. And we also saw for a model, suppose we have a fixed cost, because the, we show that, that exchange can increase their profit by offering additional stock exchanges. But the marginal benefit will decrease. So a fixed cost will stop the operator to establish more exchanges. Okay, why this is interesting? Because this paper discovered a new form of 
price discrimination. Think about price discrimination. We usually think about second degree price discrimination. It's like a quality price. It's like economy class, business class of, of airlines. <laughs> okay, but in this case, the price discrimination actually is like the operator using one side of the market, which is the taker, to price discriminate the other side of the market, which is the taker. And also, this is driven by the tick size. We solve the model, actually, if the tick size is zero, there's no price discrimination because everybody goes, goes to the exchange with the lowest total fee, according to tax neutrality principle. So next, I want to show you there's no pure strategy equilibrium. So to simplify the presentation, we consider two competing operators. Each one of them offer one exchange. OK, and the results we have is like, there's non-existence of pure strategy equilibrium. That explains the diversity and fluctuation of exchange fees. And also, we prove any mixed strategy equilibrium actually has positive profit. That explains the entry into this game. OK, the first part is like, this part is pretty straightforward. In this game, no exchange can make a positive profit in pure strategy equilibrium. Why? The intuition actually follows similar to Bertrand. It's like, suppose we have two exchange with different uh, profits. Suppose the, the operator one have slightly more, uh, have equal or the same profit as operator two. And the operator two can always have a profitable deviation. Basically, they choose the same quality, but slightly reduce the price. That will help exchange uh, operator two to increase the profit. Okay, the main result is this line. Even if both exchange has zero profit, they compete towards zero profit. Still, there's no pure strategy equilibrium. There are four cases to be considered. The first case is a trivial case. No trade. They, they, have, they attract no liquidity maker. Okay. The second case uh, is also relatively straightforward. It's like they set the effective price too high. Uh, so suppose they set the effective sale price above a half. That means, I mean, the, the operator two can just set the effective sale price equal to a half. That have already give you the maximum execution probability. But then he undercuts the effective buy price by epsilon. Okay, this to a more interesting case. So in the first case is operator one set the effective buy and the effective sale price equal to a half. This is the lowest effective sale price guarantee execution. Okay, and then what's the operator two's deviation? Operator two's deviation actually looks like that. It's like, okay, you offer the highest quality. I reduce the quality, but I reduce the price. This deviation caters to low valuation liquidity maker. Okay, and if you set the fee structure correct, you can have positive profit. Okay, although you have a, a exchange, uh, operator to have a higher total fee, but they still cater to some traders. In the second case, it's like quality is l low. In this case, the deviation actually increase the price, increase the quality, and cater to the high valuation liquidity makers. So, so it's interesting, it's like when I solve this model, my first intuition is like I get something wrong actually, because why? It's because uh, I'm not an expert on I.O., but I know there are famous results in Tirol's textbook. It's like uh, most of the price quality games have pure strategy, non Bertrand equilibrium. But then I, I think about that. Then I realize there's one big difference between the competition in like manufacturing products and financial products, like this one. Okay. So in manufacturing industries, like think, suppose you make a car, it's very hard to change the quality of the car, but you can change the price of the car pretty easily. So in that type of games, usually the quality choice is in before the price choice. In this game, you can have a pure strategy equilibrium. In this game, the quality of the exchange is just some kind of trading terms. It can be adjusted as easily as the price. And the simultaneously, choice of price and quality actually destroy pure strategy equilibrium. We actually try one thing, funny thing is like, let's have a different game. The exchange operator first period, they set the tech fee. And after they observe each other's tech fee, they set the make fee. We got the similar pure strategy clear. Okay, so here's proposition four. We prove the existence of mixed strategy equilibrium. That rationalize the fee diversities and frequent changes. Okay, and next we show 
any mixed strategy, uh, equilibrium, have positive profit. That explains the entry of the game. There's still profit. OK. So the interesting result uh, contributed to general economic, uh, economics literature is, looks like that. Because in usual mixed strategy equilibrium game or price dispersion game, the price competition is one dimension. So then we need some frictions. There are two types of friction. The first type is some customers are not aware of the best price, or they cannot react to the best price. Or some producers cannot transmit the best price, have some cost. Okay. Without these two frictions, all the consumers, they prefer the lowest price in a one-dimensional price competition. In this game, we don't have these frictions. But the driver of the result is like, then you compete on two prices. We cannot uniquely rank the price level. In one dimension, you can say from the lowest to the, lowest to the highest. But in two dimensions, you cannot uniquely rank the price. OK. So next one, I want to show you some robustness check and the policy implications. So probably you can ask, OK, suppose we have multiple ticks. What's the result? OK, here's the result, actually. I just used the one animation. He's like, suppose this guy has the lower, lower, lowest valuation. He quotes the lowest price on the continuous price. And the guys with high, higher valuation will quote higher price on the continuous price. Now let's introduce this tick size. What's the function of tick size? The tick size actually force guys with heterogeneous valuation to quote the same price. That creates the room for price discrimination. Why? Because then the operator, too, can offer a low quality exchange, which re remove the pricing grid a little bit down. And another exchange, high quality exchange, move the pricing grid a little bit up. And then you segment the trader. You have higher profit. And the other robustness check is like, let's say we endogenous the number of stock exchanges. OK? Still, I mean, there's no pure strategy equilibrium exists, as long as there are more than one operator. Why? Because the exchange operators can implement the deviation I just showed you by adding another exchange. There are two types of deviation. First one is like, suppose there's a positive profit. Then I can establish many exchanges to undercut all the existing exchanges has positive profit. And then let's think about it. Suppose nobody make profit. Then the operator can establish a new exchange, either with the lowest quality charges the lowest price, or the highest quality charges the highest price, and has positive profit. OK. So I want to show you two policy implications of this model. First one is like, there's heated debate on make-take fees. And there are two, so now there are two proposals, two alternative fee structure. The, the first uh, proposal is like, let's remove the rebates. We charge one side. The other one said, OK, we should be fair. Equal split between the maker and the taker. So what's the consequence of this? two proposals. So my model have proposition seven shows like this will reduce one dimension of price competition. OK. Suppose you charge one side. That's one dimension. That's pretty uh, straightforward. But suppose equal split. Then I change with higher make fee also have a higher take fee. So then it's still one dimension competition. That reduces to a trend. Here's the interesting fact. I, I don't see my model fully explain that, but it's consistent. So New York Stock Exchange, they have listing service. Actually, it's interesting. They support the proposal. And I believe one, re one possible reason is like they have other revenue sources, like listing. And bats aggressively oppose this proposal because I don't think they have enough resources to sustain the short run zero profit. OK. But here's the interesting fact. It's like zero make fee and zero take fee may not necessarily good in this model. Because I show you already, it's like sometimes fees can create subpenny prices, which actually facilitate trades, which can increase the social welfare. The other is uh, there's an aggressive proposal to increase the tick size to five cents. Lots of people ask me why. Here's one of the reasons. It's mandated by the Jobs Act, Section 106. The argument for that is like if we increase the tick size, we can increase the number of IPOs and create a job opportunity. OK. Uh, it's, uh, uh, this is the argument. But I question that. Because I mean, the, the, the reason they, they argue for that is like uh, there are some correlation. Uh, there are some plot. It's like a US tick size goes down, and also US IPO goes down. So tick size calls less IPO. OK. <laughs> and this is not my argument. But I want, even first, no, nobody shows the causal relationship. Second one is that 
I think a more direct consequence is actually is on market microstructure. So first one is like, you can have more free competitions to create effective price within the tick. Okay, second one, that generates more market fragmentation. And actually, I present a paper last year in this conference showing that also encourages high frequency trading. I think that's the first order effect. So here's the conclusion. So tick size first leads to non-neutralities of fees and structure, uh, free, uh, and also uh, product differentiation. That generates second degree price discrimination, which explains fee diversity and all the fee diversity within the same operator. And a mixed strategy equilibrium with positive profits that generates price dispersion and market fragmentation across operators. So I show you one market microstructure model, but the, it, this model reviews some economic mechanism, which I think can be applied to other types of competition. So let's move back to the motivating example. So now still, Armour is maker and Jim is taker, but the platform actually is not stock exchanges, actually are credit cards. But you may ask, what is the tick size in the credit cards? It's all tick size, actually it's something called a non-surcharge rule. Okay, the, so let's say, I mean, if you use American Express, you know that usually that gives you high rebates, right? But suppose a merchant can charge you more if you use American Express. Then the credit card will compete on the total fee. The rebates, all the rewards, miles, doesn't matter. But there is such a non-surcharge rule, actually prohibits surcharge. It's like you can decline American Express, but you cannot charge more. So this credit card competition, now they compete on two fees actually. It's like they compete with, uh, with rebates to card users and also charge to the merchants. Okay, so then the merchant can decline American Express, but they cannot say, okay, I charge you a higher fee. So, What's the economic equivalence between tick size friction and non surcharge rule? The biggest similarity is this is a rule which prevents two sides of the market to negotiate or to neutralize the fee structure of the operators. The credit card is another make take fee model. So, then I think it probably won't drive for the proliferation of credit cards. You probably receive so many like credit card offers, like, like give you miles, rebates, a free hotel night. Uh, I don't know my, uh, my model fully address this question. I think it's complex, but it's something uh, we can think about. Thank you.